Hey, brother, what would you think is the funniest member of Full Zero Squad? Now, what's your favorite comment joke of theirs? I think Ryan brings good ass. He does. <laughs> Ryan is like British humor. It's like Monty Python. <laughs> People like, and if you get it, you laugh your ass off. If you don't get it, you're like, <laughs> People still get humor. Who's the funniest one on there? You mean besides John Fish? <laughs> I think John Fish is the funniest member of Rule Zero, but he's unintentionally funny. One of the robot dogs. The same robot dog in Green White was pretty surreal and terrible. And Cappy's pretty funny. He can be pretty funny too. Who's the funniest one? Seventy nine T twenty four fifty eight learning learning corp little red riding hood take one. Oh boy. It's on. It's on. Let's do it. It's the stupid thing. Let's transition this to like Where is it? There it is. What's up, fellas? <laughs> Not the robot dogs? Yeah. So yeah, I hope you I dude, I'm glad you got the vibe. The whole point with this was the vibe. Because when I first came up with the show, the idea was everybody's doing all these Manosphere alpha male podcasts. And it just seems so ridiculous. And I'm like, you know what? I like, let's add a little bit of nostalgia, a little bit of a little bit of sci-fi and a ton of irreverence. Ton of irreverence. It's like a Frank Frazetta painting meets a Ralph Bakshi animation meets like the man show meets Weekend at Bernie's meets that nihilism meme that you guys have all seen. Yeah, lighthearted retro vibe. Absolutely. Is that because things used to be better back in the day? No, it's because it's just entertaining. I figure at the very least, I got to keep you guys entertained, right? So anyways, enjoy your Saturday. Hope you guys are doing well. Uh, the Red Morning merch, don't eat paint, don't eat paint, don't forget. Uh, good for men, bad for education. That's stored at ryanstone.com if you want yours. I normally should start these things with a discount code. So I tell you what, I'm going to make one. And then once I'm done here, I'm going to quickly throw it on there. If you want, I think it's T-Rex Army, all capital letters. I'm pretty sure that one still works. If not, I'll set it up. So don't get it like right now. Wait two hours and we'll throw 10% off because I'm going to be discontinuing the old, uh, the, the, the shirts and all that stuff. Like every year I'm trying to like redo it there. I like the idea that, you know, I have like a little collection of every year on the thing here. Yeah, no, they sucked. But coming to America and having my first Cherry 7-Up in the 90s was a fond memory. Dude, I remember, I can remember when, like, there was the explosion of new soda flavors. And I remember specifically Hubba Bubba Pop or Hubba Bubba Soda. And it was, like, literally that pink bubblegum flavor in a pop. And I was like, oh, damn, damn. Anywho, so back to the, the topic on this one. Since we're doing some irreverence. I, um, I was doing, I'm going to be doing an Archwinger thing. Archwinger and I are going to be chit-chatting. If you don't know who he is, you're going to learn today. You're going to learn today is like a preamble for us. Hopefully chatting on a red morning, but depending on his schedule, we might have to do it or pre-record it. We'll see what we can do. Anyway, so I'm going to introduce you to a lot of his work, which would be interesting because he's one of those, there is like a dozen red pill guys that you've never heard of that came up with everything you know of. And I'm not talking like in the marketing sense, like, oh, she belongs to the streets, get the white claw. I mean, like actually came up with stuff, like stuff that was useful, stuff that works. Unfortunately, as guys got better at putting words together, it made it be like, oh, that's a really good marketing term. We should use that. Yeah, let's use that. Uh, what about all the lessons? I uh, forget that. We got some angry boys with disposable income, sir. Wait, Roddy Piper soda? What the fuck? All right, whatever. Anyways. So I had a few examples of his work that I was going to kind of use to introduce you to him. The first one is, well, I don't know what order I'm going to do them in yet. We're going to see, we're going to play the vibe as it goes. Women act as shitty as you let them. Men are not happy. Uh, I've been hurt in the past. Maybe. Uh, women who can't cook modern day Chinese foot binding, which that title is mine, but it is his article. So that'd be pretty good. And every unhappy wife is a grape victim. Oh my God. Did he really bring up that one? Yes. Cause I think a lot of guys kind of, they kind of need to hear that one. Like, you know what I mean? They need to hear it. Hey, what's up nuke. It's good to see you brother. It's raining. So I can't go to the beach. Well, not with that attitude. You can't not with that attitude. So we're going to hit those stuff up and then rule zero is on here. So we're, <laughs> since I have my redirect set up, I'm redirecting you directly to the rule zero thing from here. And the topic for that one is 
There is no soft landing for men. What does that mean? What does that mean? Oh, you're going to find out. There is no true waifu for you. It turns out Rolo has an article about this one. I remember your old videos about the grapes and all. Come back when I was zeroed out and come in here. Or back when I was zeroed out and come in here. Yeah. Yeah, and I get it. Like a lot of, like, I think the good part of this stuff that we're going to go over here is that um, it's a good way of conceptualizing what guys go through. Because you're sure as shit not getting it from the popular Red Pill podcasts. And so the good part about this is you can see, A, if you haven't been through stuff, like this is the stakes. You know, everybody's like, oh, marriage is a bad deal for men. Or I guess they say don't get married. I'm the only one who says marriage is a bad deal for men. And all the other talking points, right? They don't, they just repeat it. They don't know. Like, do you think the redheaded uh, giant there, do you think she has any idea about all this stuff she's blathering about? Do you think... The 30-year-old uh, thirty year old Miami bros, do you think they know? They don't have experience in this stuff. And a lot of guys do. A lot of you guys do. And that's the part that hurts the most. Like, I could, depending on how your speaking voice looks, any one of you guys in the chat who's, like, over 30 would probably be a much more informed co-host than the Walter guy. Which, and I'm not even shitting on them as people. They're nice enough people in real life. Just the brand. The brand. Uh, what does debate add? Oh, the debate thing. You know what? Yeah, debate. Give them what we want. I cannot stand that. I'll tell you, I, we're a little off topic. I'll work with it. And then we're going to go to the Archwinger stuff. But I'll end off on debate. So people are acting like this debate bro red pill thing is new. It's not new. In fact, like seven years ago, there was obviously, you know, of like the red pilled subreddit that was there because all the blogs were separated. There's a lot of people who couldn't make their own red pill blogs. They didn't have that much to contribute. So they made a subreddit where everybody could do like their own contributions. And here we are today. Uh, there was a sister subreddit. Well, a sister subreddit called the blue pill. And like, really? Like, yeah. So what was the blue pill? A bunch of angry chicks, STEM major chicks, you know, all the LGBTs, like all that. And they just wanted to shit on everything. Anytime a guy was like, dude, my wife left me this. And they're like, Look at this fucking moron. And they're all laughing or somebody would post how they got a little aggressive with their wife, like uh, like BDSM stuff. Look at him. He's abusing her. And it was just a constant accusations of this stuff. And occasionally there'd be some cross posting like the guys would come in and have a good laugh at it. And so somebody had the bright idea of starting a place called Purple Pill Debate. It's like, what? And yeah, no, it's not like um, like Rolo talks about it in his article, uh, Children with Dynamite, where Purple Pill is the guy who wants a red pill, praxeological life, you know, mental point of origin, all that stuff. But using that for losing the red pill tools for blue pill goals. In other words, he wants his mommy waifu. And he figures Amuse Mastery will get him there. No, they just did this because red plus blue equals purple. That's as far into it as they looked. And it ended up being a lot of really bored stay-at-home moms, a lot of email class workers who were just like, I'm bored at work, I want to argue and bitch at somebody. And it was the funniest thing ever because all they did was like bitch and moan and complain. And it was always the same things like they would complain that anything Red Pill did was completely blown out of proportion. There's no studies attached to it. All the same talking points you see now. And so the Red Pill guys eventually go, oh, that's kind of neat, like a chance to, you know, have fun and engage with the stuff. And what happened was anytime there was an actual Red Pill guy who was eloquent or knew how to talk about it, he would just get banned. Because he wasn't following the vibe. And in every MGTOW, every incel, every angry, brand new red pillar who was great as a heel. I need, they needed somebody stupid. They needed somebody angry. And that guy was there and everybody else got booted out. And so, like, if you go there, it's, it's open right now. Like, if you go there now, I haven't been there in forever. I'm going to go there right now. And I'm going to tell you what the top post is. Uh... Da, da. so this is like and this is exactly what you're seeing with the deba uh, debate bros oh uh, here we are change my view women are entitled to make men wait for sex but men are entitled to rule her out because of it like really do you see this change my view i'm allowed to have a preference how do you like the zach afron physique is male equivalent of sleeping with a guy on the first date and it's all like false equivalencies all just random debate tactics it's it's cancer and i strongly suggest you don't try it out and take a look but you know please do don't name drop me they will nuke you from orbit they don't want my name in their subreddit 
They don't want to bring me up. If you even bring me up, they're like, oh, he's a nobody. It's pretty funny. Unless somebody, and even if some like shitting on me, even then, I don't know what it is, but I, it's like I slept with somebody's mom in there and they're like, all right, nuke this guy from orbit. Anyways, back to the topic. So who is Archwinger and where did this come from? Uh, Archwinger has been around longer than probably almost anybody I know. I would say he's here old enough to be like one of the original dozen guys, maybe. And he had a situation with his wife. We don't know the specifics. I don't know the specifics. It was actually before my time, but it's probably the same as everybody else. You know, sex life diminished, girl gains weight, guy gets sexually frustrated, that kind of stuff, right? And he, like everybody else, just started putting it into field reports. Thing was, though, he's a really good writer. Really good writer. He actually has an episode on right now with um, this other guy, Joe, Joe D. Who was another one of the old school red pill guys, which is kind of neat. Anyways, so, and then he, anger phase with him lasted a little bit longer. Because I remember he was, did like an unironic He-Man Women Haters Club. And it was pretty funny. But I mean, at the time, I think it's like a lot of red pill guys. Because of all the, the hate you would get from women in the red pill. They just kind of leaned into it and decided to be Ric Flair. I, I know there's there's no way there's a modern corollary to this, but yeah. Fairly thought-provoking, red pill guys, working through field reports, wrapping the field reports into theories, that sort of stuff, right? But yeah, how come? Girls think they're an ass, and so they act like an ass? It doesn't happen. No, it doesn't happen. Nobody's Ric Flair. So that part was pretty funny. Anyways, I'll get into the... And then, um, he... The, the thing I loved about this stuff, and this is, I know this is kind of a rambly, but the part I liked about it was back in the day, everybody had beef with each other. And it was always funny because I remember in 2018, we had Tanner Guzzi, myself, a bunch of us were just sitting around a table shooting the shit. And then all of a sudden, a bunch of like guests from a convention that's in Florida that shall not be named were like, hey, can we join you guys for breakfast? And it was kind of just neat. There was like, oh, wow, I came to this thing to watch 20 influencers talk about sexual dynamics. Now they're just having breakfast. Let's go have breakfast with them. And so it turned into like an impromptu thing, which was pretty cool. It was actually probably one of my favorite parts of the event because it was just normal people talking. And I remember at one point Tanner asked uh, about why everybody can't get, why is there so much beef between all the red pill guys? And it was just like, well, like you can't tell everybody, hey, be your mental point of origin. But get along with these guys, like, full consensus. It's like, yeah, you can't tell people to be a narcissist and then expect them to play nice. But the beefs then were kind of nice. Like, for example, he and Wine More Please, who you'll probably see him in the chat at some point today, had this one thing where they were talking about... Um, what a lot of guys would do is after they got what they needed, they would delete all their posts, and then people were kind of getting irritated saying, hey, dude, like, you made so much value in here, and then you just deleted it. Why? Why would you do that? And a lot of people were just like, because I can it's like, I'm not obliged, which is true. And he and one more please had the challenge. Like, well, why don't you, if you think you're so good at writing, just delete your account and start again. You'll get more link karma or something like that. And he never did. But it was always like, they always seem so silly in retrospect. But I, this is why when you see me shit posting people on Twitter, when like, I'm like cutting to the core of the issue. That's why. Because I've seen this before. I, I Rolo warned me about this too back in the days. Like, just so you know, like... This is going to happen in cycles and everything you see right now in five years is going to be a whole new set of people doing the exact same thing. And it's, it's true as hell for the red pill as anything. Like it's true in the sense that the relationships and the sex life you have, a lot of the women are just going to meld together. Like, I don't know whoever here is single. You let me know how on the ball, on point this is where you realize. And if your game is good, you're dating a girl and sleep with a girl, you have some fun. Maybe you played her, maybe you don't. And then the next girl, and they all kind of seem interchangeable, you know? No, they're completely interchangeable. In fact, that's kind of how a lot of guys ended up going MGTOW the first time, was that they noticed that, like, all they're like, all women are NPCs. Like, they're all the same. I, I just say the line, and then I get to sleep with them. It's like, it, it, it ruins the magic. And this is where I, I understand the guys that complain that, you know, why love is supposed to be magic. Why are you doing this? It's like, I get it. Part of growing up is kind of realizing that. And there's like a superpower in realizing how interchangeable, I mean, men and women are interchangeable, but you're not sleeping with men, so you don't care. But yeah, finding out that when you're dating women, they're all basically the same. They all respond to the same things. They're literally all women are like that. And that's why it was always so weird to hear people argue about being the exception. It's like, no, 
No, the girl that's arguing that she's a good person anytime something negative comes up, that's pretty standard. Uh, yeah, so that... So even the beefs back then were better. Everything was just better. Although I think that's because I was new, not so much that it was better. I'm sure there's an older guy who's like, oh, dude. Yeah, so kind of interchangeable, but you learn to appreciate the variations. Exactly. And But this is the good part of that. Is that, you know, everybody's like high quality woman this and this. They're talking about women as if they're like a different species between trash women and good women. Like Morlocks and Eloy and or Dune. They're like, oh, the House Arconan and House Artreides. I, I, that's enough sci-fi references. I get it. I get it. But then you realize, yeah, no, just women are women. And they all generally act the same within a pretty specific Overton window. Until you get a girl that's invested. And when they're invested... They stop doing those girl things that you can't stand and they start doing the girl things that you like. And that's by design. That's because they like you and they want you to like them. Is that validation seeking? Yes, absolutely. But that is women. That is women. Hey from India, Ryan. How's it going? Ishan Verma, an ex-runner 55. Yeah, it's all different flavor. And then you start to realize like, okay, so this one's invested and this one's not invested. And this one's mildly invested. You stop looking at them like, is this the one? Is this the magic girl? It's like, no, this is just a girl and this girl's invested. And you realize it's like, and a lot of guys get despondent, like, oh, it's just an act. She doesn't really love me. And then, you know, once you grow up, you realize, well, she's invested in me. She's doing things that I appreciate. Like, what more do you want from somebody? Do you want her to, do you want her to pair bond with you like a fucking penguin? Yes, that's what I want. But I don't want to say it. I want it, I want it to just be understood. It's like, oh, I wonder if that's a covert contract. Do you think? Uh, Ishan Varma, do you get a lot of Indians here? You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised, sir. I can usually tell because they shit on me on the on the super chats with like very broken English. And then Penn from Asia. Yeah, dudes, don't worry. The actually here. So the demographic thing, it's funny in that um the two places that I did not picture a lot of guys being from that are here. South Africa and Zambia. Did not expect that. Which is crazy because uh, if I'm not mistaken, Rolo has a lot of Kenyan and Nigerian fans on his channel. So it's like we're carving up Africa. Anyways. So that's kind of who Archwinger is. He was, I mean, there's like a dozen, like off the top of my head, I can think of Bogey D6, Rule Zero Dad, Archwinger, um, Redneck 001, Human Sock Puppet, Red Pill School. There's like all these guys. And... They all get along or they don't get along, and but they were all pretty switched on. And most importantly, most importantly, they adhered to rule zero. And I, I love this question now when somebody's shitting on the red pill. Just ask them what rule zero is. And if they don't know, you're like, I don't care then. And rule zero was just so simple. It's just sexual strategy for men, positive male identity. Nothing is off limits. You can do whatever you want to. Nobody cares if you're fighting. Nobody cares if you're exurbic. Nobody cares if you're tweets are in english nobody cares anything as long so long as it is clear that your goal is one of those two paths positive male identity male sexual strategy giver nothing but patience don't worry about the beefs don't worry about that just this and it becomes very clear why that's a rule because i mean at the time it was just because most of the time we were doing things all this stuff kind of categorized into this rule anyway because it was very airport security like something went wrong fix that specific problem. And then you have like a hodgepodge of rules, create a bunch of people that then try to like skirt the boundary and cross, uh, get as close to the line as possible without crossing it. Do you realize like, why are we putting up with all this? There's just two reasons to be here. And if you're not, then don't. And this is why, if you notice, I tend to be fairly acerbic to people who aren't there. Archwinger definitely was one of those guys. So let's get into it. So I used to be a pretty strong feminist. I've actually become a feminist again. Ooh. Feminists, though, can be some of the worst people you'll ever meet. They can be, like, some of the most nasty. They'll take advantage of uh, contradictory uh, world values, right? Worldview, which is that, like, I'm talking about, like, psychology and mental health for men, and yet yeah. I'm in a field that, like, is overly feminized and shoving drugs down men's throat. And I'm, like, and I'm yeah. still recommending it because I don't want to lose, like, the baby out with the bathwater. Just because not all therapists are well-trained to work with men. Just because a lot of therapists might even be biased against particularly, like, incel-type men. If they hear misogynistic language at all, they might, like, shut yeah. you down. So, and it was just difficult because I didn't want to be, like, super, like, nasty and mean or anything. <laughs> So like, I don't miss the hair, but I kind of miss looking at the hair <laughs> every now and then. I'm like, dude, that looked pretty cool. Okay, first one. Archwinger series. Women act as shitty as you let them. The hell is that about? This one, I like it. What's the timestamp on this? Get it right. Where's my timestamps? 1932. So we'll do 19 minutes even. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, man. 
Uh, women act as shitty as you let them. And he starts, like, he starts it off with, you know, this is a lot of red pill advice out there. Overlaps conventional advice for attracting women. You know, be attractive, don't be unattractive. Lifting weights until you have a good body. Dress well, groom well. Develop social aptitude, hobbies, skills. Become professionally successful, well-connected, being confident, powerful. Having an awesome life. Everybody can get behind that. This is like, I love the duality of red pill in which, like, there's a passive self-improvement half, which everybody loves. Like, dude, yes, men should step up. Matt Walsh loves it. Um, feminist Frequency loves it. Everybody loves it, but the incels are like, why bother? And you're like, shut up. Nobody told you you have to. They're just saying it's a good way to, to not just sit at home waiting to die. He's like, yeah, this is common sense, man. Everybody knows this stuff helps you at a great sex life. Even the ones that don't help or help very little, they don't hurt. So at the very least, with conventional advice, and I'd argue it's it's semi-blue pill. Because, again, if it works, it's considered red. If it's blue, if it's, like, manipulative. That's really the easiest way to conceptualize it. And, so he's like, yeah, the red pill part of this isn't so much that doing this stuff is a good idea. Everybody knows it's good. It's the emphasis on how incredibly important it is. The traits up there, only things that matter to women. They're who define your status, your value, nothing else matters. And this is the part that people have a hard time with, especially the guys at this point. There's always certain triggers that'll trigger guys and trigger women. Anything that puts women in a negative light will trigger women. Anything that tells men that that's not your mom and she's not going to unconditionally love you will trigger men. Everything is like a variation of those two themes. And in this case, yeah, how incredibly important it is. And it depends. Like, it's... Okay, it doesn't really depend. It's just women like multiple things. I know, and you always see all those incel uh, charts of... You know the one from OK Cupid, where they ask 100 women what attractiveness a man is on the 10-point scale, and they ask the guys the same thing? And if you look at the guys chart, it's like a perfect bell curve. Like, most women are five, and then, you know, it, it trails off as it gets there. But then you look at the woman's chart... And it's like 80% of guys are considered fours. And then there's like 20% of guys that are considered eights. And that's it. Of course, that's because they're just doing looks. And this is where this is where a lot of guys get things wrong. And this is why I hate when everybody's just like ranting about the red pill, but doesn't even know what they're talking about. One sec here. There we go. Let's get comfortable. Let's get comfortable. It's just going to be you and me here. We're just chilling, having a coffee in the den, right? Pick up your coffee, a copy of Fuck Files, and let's talk about it. So the problem with that is that women are attracted to multiple things and guys are attracted to looks. Everybody says youth and fertility, but we don't know how old a girl is. We don't know how fertile he is or how fertile she, he is. We don't know how fertile she is. What we know is what's attractive and that's it. So anytime you're talking about the guys, you hear guys talking about this, they're, they're getting it wrong. Yes, we, we happen to have selected fertility, but that's almost like a happy accident. Picture... Like, and this is like a little bit of an abstract thing to drive the point of what I'm getting at here. You get cavemen attracted to everybody, all types of women, tall, short, fat, old, young, whatever. The ones who are attracted to young women who were, you know, had for great fertility, had cave babies. And the ones that were attracted to grandmothers didn't. So those ones died off. And then the trait that, uh, that psychological trait where people like those type of women would carry on. So there's a selective pressure. For us to like certain qualities. Now, there's the thing. We don't know what fertility is. But what we do know is you like guy, girls with nice hair, you know, perky breasts, the waist shape, that kind of thing. So we actually like the secondary characteristics. We don't like the main ones. And you repeat that. You iterate that over generation and generation. And then psychologically, you're in a spot where guys like, you know, I like big boobs. I like butts. I like curves. I like thinness. I like the, the nice hair. Like all those different qualities. So when you hear guys say like, well, we aim for fertility and you're going to hit the wall. It's like, no, you're not. You're aiming for things that are hot and you want to sleep with. It just so happens that that stuff correlates. It doesn't have to correlate. And this is, this is the, one of the points I try to get home in Praxeology Volume 1, where I talk about uh, the, uh, the professor out of, where was he? California, Berkeley, where he talks about how humans aren't designed to know truth. We're designed for fitness. And that's true. Like, dude, we are coded for fitness. So when we do things... And that allows us to, you know, propagate through the, the eons. That's the stuff we select for. Now, a lot of the time, it's connected to truth. It's like, yes, women who are more fertile look like these ways. So these two things correlate. But not necessarily. Not necessarily. There is a lot of vestige 
traits that we aren't that we are attracted to that have nothing to do with fertility nothing at all but why because there was no selective pressure for or against them i think they call them like neutral traits like i don't know tattoos great example tattoo doesn't make one lick of difference for fertility one way or another but some guys are very adamant about tattoo girls some guys are very adamant about not tattoo girls has no bearing on anything you could talk about well on my life the tattoo girl will kill me or in my life the tattoo girl is fun Yes, but that is not from like an evolutionary standpoint makes sense. And this is what he's trying to get to here. Status, attractiveness, provision, like all of these things. There's like seven different qualities. I'm not going to list them all. But the point is you have to understand that women are not all about looks. Guys are all about looks. I mean, we're all about other things, but the looks are what we see. So the looks are what we go by. It's the best we got. Women don't. So when you see these charts saying most women find men unattractive, that's fine. Because most women also find men that are dating other women are attractive. Most women who find men who are married are more attractive. Most men who find, or most women who find men who have status in a group are more attractive. Most women who find men have a decent salary and good resource provision. Yeah, they tend to be attractive too. Now we can argue about to what level and to what extent all of these things factor in. I'm not going to sit here... This ain't the spreadsheet podcast where I'm like, give a 0.4 uh, multiplier to looks and a 0.3 to provide, like, fuck that. Just understand that there's all these different things you can do, which I think is a great thing. Like, imagine being a girl in the dating world, 2023 20, or whatever year it is now. Thanks, COVID. I forgot what year it is now. Imagine that. And you don't know. And all you got is your looks. And everybody's filling you with dread because every time you post anything on social media, they're, they're sending you pictures of fucking egg cartons. <laughs> Imagine that. It's got to be a little bit dreadening. And oh, if you're fat, nobody will love you. Oh, if you're old, nobody will love you. And you're like 29. You're like, Jesus, I need a man. <laughs> and I'm not even saying the hoes that waste their lives. I'm talking about the ones that really try and just suck at it. But imagine as a guy. Oh, you're kind of ugly. Yeah, that's fine. I'll be the damned coolest, like, I'll be one of those awesome actors that, like, Steve Buscemi probably slays. Why? Because he's a firefighter and a famous actor. He's got pre-selection. Oh, I'll sleep with him. So it's, like, great as a guy. You don't have to have natural talents. You don't have to be naturally good-looking. Why? Because you got five other things you can min-max. And the beauty of this, and Carl talked about this years ago. The, Carl's the old uh, uh, co-host we had on here, which is awesome. Good buddy of mine. He's like, you don't even have to master one. You don't have to be a 10. You have to be like seven in four things, and that's it. And seven is achievable. A little bit of effort, and seven will get you achievable. So continuing on with Archbreaker, here he goes, where blue-pilled people, blue people go wrong is seeing valuable men have success with women via these interactions with them and then leaping to the wrong conclusion. They conclude that if they do the same things, talk to women, treat them well, have common interests, a pleasing personality, get along together as friends for a while, that that's what attracts, uh, is what attractive to women. And that will lead to success, just like it did for those valuable, high-status guys. But it does not work. Guys who lack value, but interact women with women in a pleasing manner, either become friends or get blown off entirely as creepy. And yeah, that's the thing. So what a lot of guys do now is they see what attractive men do, and... Dude, if you're hot as F, if you're, you know, got a social media brand, you're super attractive like that. And you're, oh, wow, his marriage is open on his side, like a Justin Waller type, right? And they see him, he can afford, he can afford to be a simp. It's almost like a social flex where, like, I'm so attractive, I don't even have to do these things here. And I can get away with acting unattractive because it just doesn't matter. Social signaling th or signaling theory is probably one of the best um, underutilized science a uh, social science is in the red pill today 100 percent, no doubt on that so you got to remember that when you see a lot of attractive guys doing things this is why i hate this is why i hate hearing naturals on there and like i said i i'm not shitting on waller i like waller justin's good i've never heard anybody say a bad thing about him except for that one chick on the whatever podcast but like when he tells if he were to tell you what to do it's very hard to take that seriously because yes if i was six foot two shredded you know, millionaire. Yes, that stuff would work for me. Same as Tate. If I was doing exactly, if I had what Tate had and I did what Tate did, it would probably work. But if you're, uh, who's that other guy on his stupid thing, the five foot six balding manlet, and you start pulling Tater stuff on there, you'll probably get arrested. So yeah, unfortunately, if you don't have the 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 ability to flex, 
a lack of sexual strategy, you probably shouldn't. And this is why, and it's the same with like fitness and stuff. It's never good to trust the guy who's been lean his whole life about how to get shredded. You want to trust the former fat kid who lost a hundred pounds and has a six pack now with a little bit of loose skin under his belly, you know, cause that guy knows that guy knows how to go from zero to hero. Um, seven is the new six sixes. Yeah. Well, and look off topic, but when I'm talking about having a seven and all the things, it's not hard. I wish it was, it would actually make me feel more like accomplished if it was hard, but it's not. 90 like i'm not gonna throw numbers out i'm just using those as like turns of phrase but like 90 percent of it is just showing up every day like i can even just use this as an example here the what have i got Twenty five thousand followers it's not huge but it's not small what did i do i showed up every day that's it i made videos were they any good some were some weren't they got better over time started paying attention to how to do things so that's great how about books i didn't know how to write in 2017 i was illiterate i was basically illiterate i could do a military message like you wouldn't believe if anybody hears in military communications, VZCZC, tell me if you know what that means. Yeah, I can memorize that. I still know the uh, the code of my base, CFB Esquimalt, RCWEWLA. Like, that's not English. That's not writing. But then I just did it. I showed up every day and I put words on a page and then I hired a guy and now it's a book out there. And it's the same thing with attractiveness. If you haven't worked out before and you work out consistently for six months to a year, I don't care what your program is. You will get better. You will get better than 70% of the guys out there. You will be a 7 out of 10. If you start eating as good as you can, yeah, you'll make mistakes, but just making the effort to do it for an entire year, you will be better than 7 out of 10 guys. Guaranteed. If you go talk to women, you know that stupid stat about 30% of guys haven't gotten laid? The funny part of that stat and the thing that they don't tell you is that out of those 70% of guys, most don't even talk to women. The issue is not one of unattractiveness. The issue is not one of entitlement. The issue is not one of the thought talk, thought apocalypse. It's not of like hoflation. It's not. It's that guys aren't trying. And they have all kinds of amazingly valid justifications as to why. Well, my job, it makes it too hard. Well, these Tinder bitches are too whatever. It's like, well, every girl's on OnlyFans, so I don't want to talk to a girl and then find out she's a hoe. And it's like... How do you know any of this stuff? Like, do you know this stuff is true? Or do you believe people like me because we're sitting here staring at a fucking camera telling you, dude, these hoes are on the streets. They belong in the streets. And you're like, well, I've heard it from him and the five other people that are ripping off his content. So it must be true. And then you're just like, well, I'll just play another game of Call of Duty. What's a war zone's a new one. And it's married and it's single. Single guys do it. Married guys do it. It's fucking weird. It's weird. It's almost like we just don't want to try anymore. And I've been I've been kind of leaning towards this side. Like I was pretty big on, okay, I get it. I see a lot of men are struggling. It's a completely different life than I've been used to. And, you know, bless the military for that. Basically forced socialization, forced competence, forced showing up to work every day. Threat of prison always helps you show up to work every day. I got some dude clicking spoons to cure tinnitus. What the hell? That's weird. Yeah, also the former skinny guy. Yeah, for a skinny guy who can put on weight or a fat guy who can lose weight. Absolutely. Um, so for a lot of this stuff, it's, there's, there's a two-pronged approach. The first part is you have to fix like the, what the, guy, the guy's worldview, I guess is the best way to put it. When I talk about frame, part of it is obviously your mental point of origin, understanding that you come first, healthy level of selfishness, the... The uh, benevolent dictator, whatever whatever terms you want to use for that. But another part of it is you have to understand the way the world is and not the way that they're telling you it is because it's completely different. People lie to you. People lie to you because ultimately they want your money. They want your resources. They want your, they want your work. They want something from you. And they are telling you pretty lies in order to get it. And they found the most effective way is to craft a narrative in which case the only reasonable and rational decisions you make are ones that are in their best interest. Welcome. That's PR, public relations, marketing, propaganda, whatever you want to call it. And it's not some weird like, oh, only the Germans in the fort. No, everybody does it. Everybody does it. Half of my peers, and I, I use the term very loosely, are sitting in here yelling at you about how women ain't shit and you're awesome. I still remember to this day, I think I still have the link saved. I hope I do. 
when I was on with Hotep Jesus and he showed me, where is it? It was an episode or it was a, it was a document that some marketing guy put on. Maybe I didn't save it. Oh, that's going to be horrible if I didn't. Ah, well, I guess we'll get him next time. Oh, wait, maybe it's there. Nope. All right. Well, whatever. Anyway, all it said was your goal as a marketer is to convince people everything you're doing is the right decision. Everything you did is right. The problem is with somebody else. And with this one tip or trick, I can you can solve this problem. And you kind of have to be subtle about it. You can't be overt with this. Otherwise, it turns into a sale pitch. That's why so many content creators that are claiming to be Red Pill are sucking at it. Because they're, they're flat out just like telling you everything. They're being autistic about it. So yeah, women act as shitty as you let them. So now, back to this. And this what I love too, because like you can break down every paragraph he has in here as something big. Here, I'll throw a link if you guys want to read it too. Figure that's only the that's only the only polite thing I should be doing right now. There she is. There she is. Yeah. Women mirror valuable men. Valuable men are the containers, while women are the liquid that fills the space they are given. Women who interact with valuable guys end up taking interest in the valuable guy's skills, his hobbies, his conversational topics, even if those things never interested the woman before. They suddenly notice how cool those things are and want to learn more. Likewise, when an awesome guy expresses displeasure or distances himself from something like he does, she changes the behavior. She conforms to please him. And this is why there's so many women that pretend to act like raging narcissist cunts. Raging. It's because there's an insecurity about this. I don't know. There's like a whole bunch of reasons why. And I'm not here to like psychoanalyze women. I don't care. I just know it's there. Because you see this manifest in tons of different places. So for example, I think Jack 10 talked about this. Where a, a father is the only person in a woman's life who gives her validation for reasons other than sex. And the examples he used was, you know, when she does something. When she like rolls her eyes at dad's corny jokes. Dad stops paying attention to her. So she realizes, okay, better laugh even though it's not funny because because uh, I want my dad's validation, shit like that, right? And then when, you know, girls are attracted to a man, they do the same thing. It's called mirroring, and it's technically a quality of borderline personality disorder. I mean, the disorder means it's at a pathological level, and what does that even mean? Well, you can ask, but psychologists don't really know either. They kind of, they, they, they give you, like, broad categories, but they... Psychiatrists and psychologists talk about disorders in the same way that airports talk about security. It's always based on what was the last thing to happen, which it's it's not ideal, but I mean, it's, it's okay. It's just a lot of correlations. But that's the point. So, best example is women didn't give a shit about Warhammer until Henry Cavill started painting figs. That's all I gotta say on that issue. And yeah, and it works the other way, too. This is why you can't just mirror what uh, high-value men, or whatever the fuck that means, are doing. Because when a man is low-value, women laugh at the thing he does, dub them loser activities, and distance themselves from his interest. This often leads to low-value men instead conforming to themselves to try and please women, further signifying their low value. So it's just plain off-putting. Who wants to fuck a man who acts like a woman? Do you know, like if you've been on this channel, you've heard me use the phrase men raised to be defective women so often. And right there is the crux of it. Right there. Archwinger nailed this eight years ago. Because he wants to please a girl and he doesn't have the high status to have her conform to him, aka frame, pulling her into your frame. He has to try and conform to her, which is just off-putting because he's acting like a woman. Many modern women don't have the much going on the way of personality, hobbies, skills, and interests. You'd be hard-pressed to find a 20-something woman in 2015 and pry her away from her cell phone. The lives of most modern women consist of social media, eating out, buying clothes, and dating guys. Dating guys. <laughs> Fair. The really deep ones maybe talk about music. They spend their time shallowly reflecting on the guys they want to be with, latching onto the lives of their men. It's easy to hate them, to look down on them. In fact, the red pill encourages a negative view of women. Why? Because when you see women as non-unique, non-special beings, each one defined primarily about how much of a boner her appearance creates, you can approach them confidently without really caring how things go. Because 
what's the matter if one particular non-unique, non-special woman doesn't fuck you tonight? So if your woman's being shitting to me, shitty to you, it's because you're letting her. She's reflecting her own shittiness back at you. Women are only shitty as you let them be. But you see what I mean? Like everything, and this is why everybody's like, why do you have to be so mean to women? It's like, well, there's a few reasons. Like one, you don't listen. Most guys are so stuck in their little fantasies in their head until you shock them out of it with some old, good old He-Man Woman Haters Club stuff. They're not going to listen to a word. Another part of it is it's really similar to that whole if you're scared of public speaking, picture your audience in their underwear. It's like that. You need to hate women just a little bit. Just a little bit. A lot? No, just a little bit. It's all you need. They're not, they're not very different from each other. And the funny thing is, too, is like whenever you say this in a co-ed group, there's always a girl that's like, well, what about women? What about women? Or women have to put up with this stuff? from Like, maybe. But here's my question to you. How come every time I bring up a real guy situation, it's happened yesterday on fucking Twitter for all places. Why is it every time I bring up a legitimate male grievance, you have to what about as I'm into girls? Is that your way of saying, well, let's just drop it. Everybody's shitty. Or is it like you personally feel offended? I don't know. I don't care. I just refuse to engage with people given that whole um, what about as I'm derail the conversation nonsense. It's like, no, 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 no. If you want to talk about women and how bad they got at dating, go real Ben Sapiens right there. She, Ali will be more than happy to give you her man ain't shit thing and I parade her for it. And she'll probably give you some good advice and a good talk about it. That's great. This ain't here. This ain't here. It's been weird as hell seeing all these women playing Warhammer 40k. <laughs> well, I haven't seen them playing it. Actually, I did see one or two. I was for a while there. I was trying to get into 40k, like understand why it was good. And I kind of get it, but I probably still won't buy like $20,000 in figurines and paint them for 20 hours of my life or 200 hours of my life and then play like a seven hour game with them and dice. <laughs> but I get it. And yeah, there was quite a few like wife and husband couples. And that's the funny thing too. You even get the chubby, chubby Warhammer collector guy and he's got his chubby Warhammer collector wife and she got into it because she liked him. And now they're both into it and they're sitting there eating hot dogs and fighting Tyranoids versus Space Marines. I think I got it. I think I got it right. I think don't quote me on that one. Yeah. Don't put women on a pedestal. And that's the thing, Nick. Like, yeah, I can just say, don't put women on a pedestal. And as a guy, most guys will be like, yeah, absolutely. Why would you want to do that? There'll be some guys that fight you, but most reasonable guys are like, yeah, why would you do that? But there is a disconnect between saying, I don't want to put my woman on a pedestal. And then the behaviors that actually put her on a pedestal. And I've seen it, dude, in my Patreon. It's like a lot of guys, some of the first month or two was spent just pointing out, like you just said this was your goal. And in the next sentence, you did the exact opposite thing. Do you know why? And a lot of guys are like, no, that doesn't count. It's like, no, that's exactly what this is. And I realized that guys have a real disconnect from what they think they want and from what they actually want. And that's why it seems so simple, but a lot of the work is just about getting a guy to be honest with himself. Like, which is insane. Imagine that. At least be honest with yourself. Do you know who's not honest with themselves? Whammon. Whammon aren't honest with themselves. They aren't. They lie to themselves because it, it suits their needs. At least, at least they're self-invested. They're self, that's solipsism, right? She lies to himself, herself when it benefits her. Nothing happened between me and that other guy. And she believes it too. She might have done something. She blew him like five minutes ago. Nothing happened. We just we just talked. See, it was just a conversation. <laughs> but she believes that with her whole heart because it benefits her to do that. And I, I wish, I wish. I don't know what it is where it's like men are raised to be defective women, but they don't seem to catch that self-interested vibe. You know, the most important part, the good parts. That's why it's always defective women. Same as women. Your Women were told they can be anything, so they decided to be drunken, adulterous frat boys. And it's like, dude, is that the best you can do? I don't know. I'll never understand it. But as long as you know it's there, you can work around it. I don't usually post pictures of my kids online, but they're infants and you can barely see them, so, you know, it's, it's fine. But a YouTuber named Ryan Stone, named Ryan Stone, named Ryan Stone, tweeted, showing off the F trophies for clout. So the babies are trophies that I'm showing off. It's perhaps not a surprise that a picture of a proud father would be so upsetting to the sort of man who clearly never had one. You know, I think the classy thing to do would be not to draw attention to it. 
<laughs> All right. So modern day Chinese foot binding. What the fuck are you talking about? If you guys, do you guys know what this is? I mean, I remember one of you guys said you were from China. I think you'll probably know this one. Uh, Chinese foot binding was a popular trend. I don't remember the age. I think it went as far because I remember there was photographs of it. So I know it's at least up to the 1800s. But what a lot of women would do, especially higher class aristocratic women, is they used to bind their feet in these tiny, tiny shoes. And it would deform their feet to the point where they couldn't even walk. Couldn't even walk. You're like, why would somebody do that? Why would you remove the need to walk? And like, imagine what a social flex that is saying, how, living well and like, I can't even walk. And look at this shit. <laughs> so yeah, and um, so it starts from Archwinger again. One of my favorite hobbies is cooking. I cook about 90% of the stuff for my family and for guests, visitors, strangers, people at work. I'm no Martha Stewart, but I'm decent and I enjoy it. Not the cutting. Not the standing at the stove, not dabbling in the spice rack, but the overall act of creating food that other people enjoy. Whenever my wife is, vow is wowed about something I make, she always asks, what did you put in there? And I always respond with love. She chuckles, and he's joking, and then asks what I really put in there, but it was a pretty honest response. He cooks with love. It's just a piece of me on each plate, which sounds crazy. And he's like, what I used to do today is what women used to do all the time. Not because they were oppressed. Not because they were forced to by the evil patriarchy, but because it was an admirable thing to spend the day creating something out of love and nourishing your family. To bring homemade pastries to the neighbors. To make appetizers for your kids' events. To invite your husband's boss over for dinner. To share your love. Everyone's got to eat, so the one universal way you can give love to everybody is by feeding them. Today, most women laugh and spit at the act of cooking, or cleaning, or folding the laundry. Especially folding the laundry. <laughs> Or having sex with their husbands. The very notion of doing anything that serves, helps, facilitates, or gratifies another person. Especially a man. Especially a man. And especially, especially, the husband is demeaning, oppressive, and downright insulting. It's not so much that women brag about not knowing how to cook. They brag that they don't even have to cook. And that is the modern woman's ideal. And this is what I was talking about with signaling theory. The less they have to do the more bragging rights they have amongst other women. And this is when everybody's like, uh, social media is damning women or is ruining women. It's got some merit to it, but it's not for what you think. Guys think it's just girls watch social media and they've turned brain dead, right? It's because it extends our monkey sphere. Have you guys heard of this term, the monkey sphere? Turns out with the size of our brain, the way it is, we can only conceptualize about 150 individual people. Any more than that, we kind of have to abstract them away into, into categories. That's why Trump supporter has like a visceral reaction, either positive or negative in people's minds, because they don't have enough people in their monkey sphere. So now Trump supporter becomes an individual, one of those people, even though that describes like a million people or 10 million, however many people it is. Liberals, conservatives, uh, feminists, red pill guys, manosphere. And this is why everybody has these stupid takes on on all of these categories is because they just don't have the mental capacity to have individuals in their heads so they have to stereotype it you know, african-americans canadians americans you go to europe ask what do you think of when you think of american they think of a fat person that's that's it it's not because all americans are fat it's because they have the conception of american as one of their 150 people and that guy is a fat fuck and women do the same now here is the problem is that when you get to social media Clout becomes a thing. Because remember what we talked about in the last one, his uh, women act as shitty as you let them? It's that women are attack attracted to status. Status. This is why Louis Vuitton can sell a purse for three grand. This is why, you know, a, a, a tall, attractive man that's got girls all over him gets more girls all over him. And this is why social media does some damage to women. It's because they have an artificial status. You get a girl who is higher in followers than anybody else and what's the best way to get followers right now by being a cunt you know why because people look at it like a like a modern day freak show and so you see women act like absolute retards absolute retards and it gets a lot of followers and then other women see this and like oh well if i'm gonna mirror the most popular person in the room which is this chick and what does that chick do she starts following along with these chinese foot binding techniques I can't cook. No women can cook. Well, she was just on Pierce Morgan, so it's good enough for me. So girls are now bragging about how they can't cook, and they don't learn to cook. Now, it's not the only reason they're doing it. If you take away social media, 
like they still have their social circles and it all kind of leans in that direction because that's like a, a very common flex amongst girls and that's important everybody's like well what about if a good man like i don't know what the percentages are but i'm just going to say half intrasex and intersexual competition that's our two pathways we lean on here the one competing with other guys or you know if you're a girl competing with other girls to be the best one in the group and then competing over the other sex now when it comes to the intr intrasexual that's easy that's when girls look hot that's when they show a little cleavage that's when they act available that's when they have good game they make themselves available everybody knows that girl game stuff but then girls competing with other girls that's when shit gets a little bit harsh and that's where the social media kind of flicks in here do you get a situation where girls just love being useless and nobody's going to argue with them people will lie to women why wouldn't you dude if i'm selling single serving meals and I got a bunch of chicks bragging about how they can't cook. Of course I'm like, yeah, you're right. Don't let no man tell you what to do. How, Dude, boiling water is patriarchal. Here, have some chicken tendies. $10, please. Or I guess $20. $20 is the new $10. Thanks, Trudeau. Modern Chinese foot binding. So yeah, the less they have to do, the more bragging rights they have amongst other women. Something to think about. So how do you solve this stuff too, right? And I mean, you can't. That's kind of the, the, the nihilism point. That's why I'm wearing my favorite Hawaiian shirt today. You guys know, because I've, I've always based it on this one meme. Uh, the, it's, you've seen it. It's been around for forever. It's like what people think nihilism is versus what nihilism is. And what people think it is, is like existential dread where somebody's sitting in the corner crying like, oh my God, nothing even matters anymore. But what it actually is, is a guy, you know, brightly colored, wearing a wearing cool shirt and shades. Just like, hey, doesn't matter, whatever. And that's it. So yeah, girls are going to pretend they don't know how to cook and all this stuff. That's fine. You just give them enough rope to hang themselves with. You don't try to change them. I think that's the worst thing. And this ties into a different concept. We're a little off topic here, but we're ahead of schedule. So whatever. Um, what a lot of guys find is that there is uh, attractive qualities you can do that are considered alpha and some that are considered beta. And the, forget what you heard on whatever else. You guys probably know this already. You've been here long enough. But for those that are new, alpha qualities are things that make a girl sexually desirable or sexually interested sexual attraction makes her wet beta desires are relationship comfort easiest way to think about that so uh you know having having coke at the phone party oh that guy's hot being the drug dealer being the tall status symbol being attractive that stuff's alpha funny enough an orgasm is beta. Like what? Yeah, it gives serotonin and oxytocin. It turns out there's chemical and hormonal responses to both alpha and beta. And that once you understand those, it helps give you an underpinning of like what the reality is here. So this stuff does map fairly well. Um, if I remember correctly, and it's uh, Athel K talks about it in Married Man's Sex Life Primer. So I, I might get a couple of the things off, but I'm broad strokes correct here. You look into it if you want better. It's uh, testosterone. Um, adrenaline uh dopamine endorphins alpha hormone responses butterflies in the stomach right beta ones are serotonin and oxytocin the the comfortable ones the the mate pairing ones you know when people talk about that uh leonidas four dollar 99 cents super chat thank you very much sir love your work just posted my question below okay good i'll check it out oh there it is if a girl asks to be exclusive with you after sex, but she breaks your boundaries with trust, would you tell her overtly that that's a deal breaker? Well, so here's the easy thing about this one. Uh, you don't have, like, there's no, I have to do it this way. This is one of those very basic first level, 101 level red pill mental models. It's the assertive bill of rights. You don't have to make sense. You don't have to be consistent. You're allowed to change your mind. And you're allowed to give no reason at all for things. So depending on your level of abundance, the easy answer is just if she crosses your boundary at that early on, just ditch her. Just ditch her. Get another one. Any problem out there that exists, if there's this one girl, you're doing it wrong. Plate theory. The idea is you should be dating multiple women. And so you just have zero time for BS. And the funny thing is that the way your vibe changes when you're dating multiple women, other women stop doing stuff that crosses your boundaries, right? So that's the easy one. But the in the married red pill, the idea there was let her know it's a boundary and always frame it from your perspective. Not saying you can't do this. Just say 
I don't date girls that do X, you know, word it however you want to word it, but that's the difference. See the difference, a you statement versus an I statement, you it's confrontational, automatically women will fight against it. But the I statement is just, it, it's a categorical or it's a hypothetical. If you want to be with me, these are my terms and she can do whatever she wants. But if she's interested in you, she'll try not to, or at the very least try to manipulate you out of it. But yeah, if you're dating, if you she wants to be exclusive with you after sex, like <laughs> slow down. You're not entitled. No. All of this one though, I'm just surprised you didn't say no. You want to be exclusive after sex and then she does some goofy shit that you don't like. It's like, no, I don't think so, man. Or maybe, I don't know. I'd have to think about it. We're not there yet. However you want to word it. So yeah, modern Chinese foot binding. That's where we're at with that one. And it's just not a, it's, you can't fight it. So all you can do is be attractive and have options. That's really it. It's that simple. It's not that simple. Like it's easy to explain, but it's not simple. You basically have to unlearn a whole lot of shit out of your life. You know, some of you have it worse than others. Granted, you have to essentially be a prick. And I, I don't mean this in like a, you have to be a jerk. Women hate you. It's like, no, you have to be selfish. Cause when you say being a prick or being an asshole, what you actually mean is you're looking out for your own self-interest for that of all women around you. And that's the thing that's heinous. That's the part that people ultimately don't like with the red pill, whether they know it or not in the land of human beings, we are genetically hardwired to prefer women over men, period. Women always take the side of women over men and men usually take the side of women over men. So anytime you're like, no, me first will automatically be seen as evil, as wrong, as heinous, unless you're in a relationship because everybody hates an asshole, but they love when he's my asshole. That's why Trump was as popular as he was. Everybody's like, nobody argued, even the biggest diehardest Trump supporter. Nobody argued. He's a philanderer or no, what's the one? I don't even, that's the wrong word. Philanderer is the charity one, but like nobody argued he was nice. Nobody argued he was kind. Nobody argued he was presidential. They're like, no, he sucks at all of those things. He's a prick. He's loud. He's bombastic. He's arrogant, but he's my, my asshole, not yours. And that's exactly what it was. Uh, would that explain why Tony Stark is so popular? Well, yeah, that's how he was written. It's how he was written. You got to be careful using fiction as an example, by the way, because the writers, the writers create their own world. And yes, a good writer will have it mapped to the real world enough that you don't have to suspend disbelief. But come on, you've seen writing the last couple of years. Is that really happening? Not really. The problem is the writer can write for anything to happen and it'll happen and he'll make it make sense. And if you look at that, you're just believing what some weird beta male writer is doing and not things that map to reality. Uh, what would your argument be on your partner not to wear too revealing clothes? Well, this, it's not an argument. It's not an argument. Do you date a girl that wears too revealing clothes? Yes or no? And if the answer is no, well, if she starts wearing revealing stuff, it's like, oh, you're wearing that out? Yeah, of course I am. I'll see you tonight. All right. Then change your locks. Or better yet, just a motor to plate. Look, if a girl is invested in you, they have signs of being invested in you. You know what they do? They delete all their whole friends from their Facebook or their Instagram and shit. They, they start dressing in ways that you enjoy and they stop dressing in ways that you don't enjoy. Some girls are stupid and don't catch on. So yeah, maybe sometimes it's like, is that what you're wearing out? It's like, am I not good enough? And then you just trust them to either be invested in you or not. And I think that's what most guys miss. They keep hearing these things like this girl's not invested in me. How do I make her invest in me? And the answer is you don't, you don't. She will show you if she's invested in you and you need to have the mental point of origin to understand that this ain't the one just demote her to plate. If she decides she doesn't want to invest and have your boundaries, then yeah, I'll put her in the fuck only box and that's okay. It has to be okay because you're dating more than one woman. Each individual one cannot be special. If it is, especially this early on, you're setting yourself up for failure and every fucking guy, every fucking guy out there who married his high school sweetheart and did put the girl on a pedestal and it happened to work out, will cheerlead that. The Peterson, like, oh, you just got to do all of this unattractive stuff because it worked for me because the first girl I slept with when we were 15 is still with me today. And it's like, dude, 
that is not how it works. You got lucky. It's like a lottery winner telling you how to win the lottery. Oh, just pick seven, seven numbers just to do it the way I did. It'll work. I mean, it worked that one time, but nobody writes the story about the 7 million guys who did that and then didn't get the girl because that's a boring story and nobody wants to hear it. So that's modern Chinese foot binding anyway. <laughs> in what do uh, not Ryan Stone? I'm, I see he's the most important guy in the world. Ryan Stone. Give a fuck about Ryan Stone. Me and him have gone back and forth. Blah blah. Yeah. blah. Ryan Stone does not pass the six foot test. He's not even a man. So I don't give a fuck what Ryan Stone. It's one of my favorites. I don't know why. It just is. I think it's because it's the first one out of all of the guys that understand it's kind of like a wrestling promo and have the good pizzazz to it. Everybody else is kind of like playing it legit and trying to talk. Like, everybody doesn't really mean what they're saying. Like, the erudite, she doesn't give a shit. Matt Walls clearly is just reading off a script. But, you know, Tate really sells it. Like, you really believe that he doesn't give a fuck about Riot Stone. <laughs> and I just appreciate the effort. Uh, Jason with the 699 super chat. I utilized I statements to set boundaries in the past, but was criticized for having everything be about me, me, me. How would you respond to that? Dude, is it wrong? That's the thing. Look, is it wrong? You're not wrong, madam. Everything is about, why does everything have to be about you? Well, cause I give a shit about me. Like there's no, what it is. It's absolutely true. Here's the funniest part. So you're using I statements, you're setting boundaries, you're establishing your frame and your own mental point of origin. The girl calls you on it and then you have to justify it. It's like, no, there's no justification. That's just me. You know what you got into. Everything needs to be about you. Yes. Yes, it does. Well, why? Look, I treat you well. Everything is about me. You're just going to have to trust that I will still treat you well. Now make me a sandwich or whatever. But don't take it seriously. If anything, that's actually a shit test. Is this guy really that confident in himself? Does he really have that much frame? It's obviously a subconscious thing. It's not somebody's conscious decision to say this stuff, but that's kind of the vibe that's going on here, right? The, the subtext. Is he really this asshole that I think he is? And then they'll say some stuff like this. And I guarantee you with your body language and you started deering, defend, excuse, explain, rationalize. Oh, I get it. So he wants to act like a man now. And that's the response they get from it. So yeah. Anyways. So here's one of my favorites. Everybody loves this one. I will admit. Out of all the clickbait titles. Archwinger just nailed this one. Probably one of the best all time field report. Or theories from the red pill. Every unhappy wife is a grape victim. Hard G. Hard G grape. I love this one. There has been some debate over what should and should not constitute grape. What should or should not constitute consent? This should or should not have been solved centuries ago, although as we get smarter, it makes it harder to maintain our memory of such trivial details. Modern enthusiastic consent only not only require a woman to agree verbally, but to be damn near excited about it and to provide ongoing verbal affirmations that it's okay to continue during the entire encounter. You need to get a signed affidavit each thrust. It's like signatures on your divorce papers. Every page needs initials on the bottom corner. I want to make sure you've read every page, sir. We often complain that the de definition is slowly expanded to include regret. A more accurate definition, idealized to the most pro-anti-woman advocates, would be sex that I have may have agreed to but didn't really want and kind of felt coerced into having. Yeah, so he's like a staggering number of marriages and long-term relationships are unhappy. They would, we would all be old and dead if we took the time to count them, where nagging and overweight shrews are emasculating timid, underachieving, out-of-shape husbands, hourly. All of this while the shrew begrudgingly agrees to missionary sex once every six weeks to keep the marriage limping along and the paychecks coming. You can change a few of the adjectives in the previous sentence here and there, but sadly, this concept applies to a very large number of marriages and relationships. And he brings up a story of his old friend. He used to have uh, one of those bad marriages. And we talk every now and again. He's, he recently told me that things came to a head in his marriage. Married for seven years, having once a month duty sex, true to his blue blood beta male roots, he finally became unhinged. He gave his wife an ultimatum and thinks he's won. Now he's getting more frequent sex. Basically, it's called the F me or F you speech. It's not good. It's not good. So, uh, they're having drinks and he's acting all like a tough guy. Like, yeah, I'm getting laid now. I'm the alpha male, whatever. And then at one point he's sitting there drinking. He's with the wife. 
And she's like, yeah, I don't know, just kind of being a moment of honesty. It's like, it's kind of hard being more sexual with him. And he's like, what's so hard about it? She's like, what? Like, what's so hard about it? People have sex all the time. It's like 10 minutes. It's not physically demanding. It feels good. People do it all the time. She's like, I don't know. I mean, it's physically easy. It's just not, and it's not challenging. It's just hard to make myself do it. And then Arch is like, I get it. I get it. He's like, that's exactly what I thought she meant. And it's because she doesn't want to have sex with her husband. But she does it because it's like she forced to. Otherwise, she loses the lifestyle to which she's become accustomed. And he's like, I don't have any studies on this, but I'm pretty sure it's it triggers the same neural pathways that a grape would have or a sexual assault. That idea of like a loss of agency, a loss of power, you know, how like the only agency a woman has is her sexuality. But these kind of coercive type moments may not be to the same level, but they're the same thing. And that's why he's like, yeah, so. Really, you got to stop. I think an ultimatums are good because, and this is expanding on what Rolo talks about as the um, uh, ultimatums are the ultimate form of powerlessness. And oh, what's his other one? Oh, the only thing I could come with negotiated desire is obligated compliance. That was the one. And so, yeah, that's the best you're going to get out of it. This is why communication doesn't work. You can't negotiate desire. This is why ultimatums don't work. This is why ultimately coercing your girls like oh you got to do this or i'm going to divorce you all that fear stuff it doesn't work doesn't work because at best you're just going to get a girl who's constantly feeling that same two out of ten grape scenario is this hyperbolic probably but it gets it but you get the point now don't you like you understand the dilemma here and it's just the idea that burden of performance that be attractive don't be unattractive have pre-selection remember everybody thought all the other stuff was supposed to matter it doesn't matter that was two articles ago it doesn't matter all that matters attractiveness status aloofness the dark tra like all those attractive traits those are all that matters it doesn't matter if you've been married a year or 10 years or 20 years those still are the only things that matter everything else is a flex saying i've got this much desire that i can afford to be this much of a fucking beta male or whatever right and does it matter if any of this is true does it matter if there's a peer-reviewed study no not at all why do you say that with such confidence? Without a peer-reviewed study, how can we know it's true? Well, you can try it out. If you're living in a lab, yeah, a peer-reviewed study would be great. The problem is you can't study this stuff. How are you going to narrow this down to a single variable? How are you going to get the in influence of this without passing an ethics board or, or uh, self-reported studies, which are horribly inefficient? No, you can't. So all you can do is get like a best guess heuristic or a narrative structure to anchor your decisions. And yeah. The guys who understand these things and understand the model and they internalize the model, they make better choices in their relationship. They stop negotiating with sex with their wives. They stop um, They stop assuming that a ring is all you need for a blowjob and shit like that. They start acting better. And that's really all this is. Like we really, it really is. Like I don't want to say we're fighting for the hearts and minds of men, but it is, there is information out there, conflicting narratives, all fighting mem memog memetically. Fighting memetically <laughs> for the hearts and minds of men and women. And unfortunately, some of the worst stuff is getting out there. And this is a big reason why, like, the birth rate's in decline, why uh, people are single in their 40s and have never been married, and why people are still living with, like, all of this shit. There's some environmental factors, sure, but there's a lot of it that kind of feeds off of that loop. And this is why. Yeah, hence the fairy tales we tell our friends. Yeah. Okay. Let's do another ad. Name a bigger red flag than a white guy with a podcast. I'll wait. I am not f impressed. I will have you know, I'm like 80% white. The podcast is goddamn good, and I don't want you anyway. You got random Iroquois art and not art on your walls. You're not my type, sir. Or madam. I don't know, you're allowed to say anymore? <laughs> Yeah, and Barbarian's right, too. Just look at who pays for the study. That's all you need to know. Like, it's very easy to have motivated truth. It really is. I mean, there's p-hacking, which we, Rolo and I talk about it, and we refer to it once. But I'll, So if you guys don't know what the p-value is, it turns out, like, you actually have to account for the odds of randomly getting it right. Flip a coin 10 times, what are the odds it's going to be heads or tails? Well, 10 times isn't enough to get, like, a large average numbers so you might get heads 10 times and then your study's like well most quarters only have heads 
So what you have there is a p-value, and a p-value is what are the odds that the thing you're studying would have happened by random chance and not because of the variable that you're discussing. And that's what the p-value is. So like 0.05 is like 5% and something like that. I think 0.05 is the, is the industry standard. Now here's the funny thing. There's no reason for that. That was an arbitrary number they picked. That was it. But... Depend, but a lot of people realize now, it's like, well, my, I, I don't make money unless I get a lot of studies out there. And nobody's going to read my study unless it's got a p-value of 0.05. So what you can do is you can craft the study in such a way that the p-value meets the definition of what you're trying to find. You can actually change the hypothesis so that way your p-value matters. It's called p-hacking. And a lot of people do it. More than you think. There's a reason why... The replication crisis is up to like 85% in the social sciences. 85%. Do you know what that means? That's not even a coin flip. For most social sciences, you're better off flipping a coin to decide whether to do one thing or the other rather than going by a study. That would be a 50% replication crisis. At 85%, it's almost a better strategy to do the opposite of what you read. The opposite of what the science says. And yeah, it's all motivated science because... People treat science as if it's proving things right. It doesn't. All it can do is falsify. The only valid purpose of science is to show you what's wrong. They cannot show you what's right at all. So that's why I hate when you see people saying, the science says this, trust the science that, where's your certification? It's like, no, none of this works. You're bastardizing the whole thing. And it's really just, and I hate to say this, it's like atheists who have just picked a different religion. And I know it's so cringe because it's not what's like, well, for them it is. And to be fair, they probably have fundamental evangelist, evangelical parents. And part of their rebellion is to, is to turn away from God. But the problem is that's the only thing they know is how to act as if they were religious. And so they just attach those behaviors onto a different set of models. Yeah. All I know is RP science works. Yeah, well, exactly, Doug. It's not even science. It's just praxeology. And that's... That's kind of like the the natural pushback from this. If 85% of the time anything you say is wrong, then what what's true? What What's right? What's useful? Well, if I can touch it, if I can see it, if I can smell it, if I can make it happen twice, like if I can purposefully make this happen, then it's right. And that's a praxeological approach. It's like auto mechanics. Do you think auto mechanics care if there's a new study showing that blah, blah, blah? Like they don't care. You know what I know? If I tighten that lug nut on the camshaft, this car will run. That's all I care about. They don't need to know about, you know, at best, they're going to have to know about the, um, how, how strong to tighten the bolt, the torque. How much torque do you need for this? Well, if you put too much on there, it screws it up. But if you put too little, it screws it up. You know what I mean? Yeah, the science of swapping notes. It's almost like a hobbyist. Like back in the day, like I remember there was this one researcher in like the 1800s who wanted to who didn't know about uh, sweat and energy release. So what he would do is he'd sat on a scale all day and he'd weigh all of his food and he'd weigh his, his like when he took a shit, he'd weigh all that stuff. And he's like, all right. So the human body actually loses more weight over time. So it's clearly disappearing in somebody else. And that's where he found out about sweat and energy and how you breathe. How Weight loss is basically breathing, stuff like that. Did you know this? Because fat is essentially carbon and water. It's just carbon and water. And so you lose the water, obviously, through, you know, pee and all that stuff. But then the carbon, well, how does your body get rid of carbon? By exhaling carbon dioxide. So all your weight loss is essentially just breathing. Synthesizing fat into energy for ATP for your muscles with a lactic acid byproduct, in which case you piss away the water and you breathe out the carbon. That's how you lose weight. So you better get breathing, you sons of bitches. Get breathing. When you lose weight, somebody else finds it. Duh. <laughs> Uh, for the hard sciences, medicine, praxeology equals case reports or case studies. Yeah, I can see that. That works. I don't want to. I don't want to fight too hard on the metaphor on like the uh, the that idea either. Because here's another thing I find. I know I am not like the best person to talk about praxeology. I'm one of them, unfortunately. <laughs> but that's not because I'm any good. It's because everybody else is really bad. But then you get somebody who's really knowledgeable about it, and they'll probably be able to nitpick all kinds of small things here, which is fair but the overarching point still stands and it still works very well and it all came from guys like archwinger man they literally did he just had his own struggling marriage and then he kind of worked it out and processed that stuff and wrote down what he did do and after a bunch of guys wrote down the same thing five or six times you wrap a story around it 
And then the guy started following it and it starts to work. The things that work carried on, the things that didn't don't. That's why dread is no longer about, there's no such thing as nuclear dread. It used to be a thing. Chrissy Mayer was talking about me on that. She's like, what is this about the, the fuck me or fuck you? It's like, oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah, didn't work. But I kept it up there anyway, because it's good to know where the things came from. Because it just turns out most guys fix their marriages and they never needed to make it that far. So when some guys started to make it that far, they're like, this is fucking ridiculous. And it doesn't work. Yeah. Well, Bill Nye's not a scientist either. If I'm not mistaken, isn't he like a, a bachelor's in engineering or something like that? Okay. So we're going to do bands for the rest of this episode. We're going to stop it at the hour and a half mark. Why? Because I have to host rule zero and I have to get a little bit of prep work done. Charles Bukowski. Jordan Peterson. Neil Strauss. I like these guys. Add some salt to cover up the bitterness of middle-aged soccer moms and put in the oven for 45 minutes. Optionally, you can take from all this stuff what you want and leave the rest. So enjoy Fuck Files. 15 lessons from a decade of women, now on audio. Sounds too Jordan Peterson-y with the accent. A lot of people didn't know that's just the Canadian accent. They're like, I thought you were trying to sound like Peterson's. It's like, no, it's just what Canadians sound like. Um, I was, I, I guess I should, it's just going to be bans for this last little bit until the half hour, but I do want to give some appreciation to people. I've been looking at my sub stack this morning, which is in, and you know, the insane thing here, um, if you look people, it's, it essentially works like an email list. And then how many people there's a couple stats that matter. How big is your email list or subscribers for sub stack, whatever, how, what percentage of those people own up, open up what you write. And of those people, how many of them click a link that's involved in those are the three metrics that matter for email marketing and Substack is essentially email marketing uh the biggest like what people expect is about a was it 12 percent open rate and a three percent click rate now i don't know what click rate is for here because it's just they have they don't use clicks because it's not like affiliate marketing but the fact that the Substack is like i'm at, at like a 45 percent open rate which is unheard of that means half the people that subscribe to it will read everything I put out there, which is insane. And so I just realized, like, you guys really are an awesome audience. You really are. And I don't show enough appreciation for that other than I will shit on retards for you and, and debase myself by arguing with nonsense and posting goatsy. <laughs> but yeah, there really is some appreciation here. And I gotta, I gotta give it to you. Thank you. Anyways, back to the banter. Let's get rid of that moment. I love those Substack emails. They really are good writing. Thank you very much, sir. Oh, they're not good writing yet. They're just first draft writing. The writing gets better. It's like I'm just about like, I'll give you a little update on the book since we're doing banters. Give me a sec here. It's going to take a second to open. So when I go to my Scrivener for the book, Dread 2023 is the working title. Project statistics. Now, ideally, you want a book between 60 and 75,000 words. The reason for that is that seems to be an adequate length for somebody to be able to read the entire book and conceptualize it in his head. Uh, if you get it any shorter than that, it's like a novella and it kind of leaves the guy wanting more. If it's much larger than that, then it's by the time you get to the end of the book, a lot of guys will forget what's in the first part of the book. So you kind of want it around there. It's, uh, it's at 92,000 right now which you want to do. This is actually something I learned from the Jordan Peterson writing guide back before he was like, this was like pre uh, the bill C10 or whatever the, the pronouns bill. And he's like, yeah, you want to write 20% more than you actually want to have on there. So it gives you a lot of opportunity, what they call kill your darlings, basically the stuff that doesn't carry the narrative forward, the stuff that doesn't have information. So you, I kind of want to cap it at a hundred thousand and then, for a second write, redo that one, I basically refine everything. So thank you for enjoying the writing now. But the next bit there is going to get rid of all of the fat. All of the fat. It's going to be fairly lean and almost legible. And that's when I hand it over to Nick. I'm like, Nick, I need you to make this look good. To which he says, you better pay me first. Then I say, okay, fair. And then I do. And then I read his notes. And it's so funny. It's so funny. Like volume one. Um... <laughs> I would see in the notes, my favorite one, he had like eight different places. Like what? <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, you better explain this, sir. I'm like, all right, fair enough. Anyways, it was pretty funny. Uh, let me 
copy this down before I lose it. I'm going to put the timestamps on here. So if you guys are watching this after the fact, you can catch up. There we go. Click the spots you want to see. That's great. And so we have about five more minutes. What do you guys want to chit chat about before we uh, get ready for rule zero? And the safe, soft landing. You, you have my full undivided attention. Clary's, of course, high IQ. Book is good. Ah, simply too awesome. 50 pound, one penny super chat. Oh, dude. Every time I see the extra penny, it warms my heart. It means you actually care. Thank you so much for invaluable work, including the sub stack. Much appreciated. Hey, man, like I said, as long as you're willing to read it, I am willing to write it. It's a two way street. I wouldn't be able to do what I do without you guys enjoying it. So thank you. Definitely. Thank you. Um, I'm thinking a lot about this topic in my channel. Tradcon red pill always has this purity thing. It says it's alpha to one virgins. Is it or is it narcissism? It's not like. Well, I mean, it is and it isn't. So here's the thing. Remember when I was talking before about how we don't know fertility? And so we pick like these side characteristics. Well, that's actually an agrarian level thinking the same thing. The reason that guys wanted virgins back then was because it was the only way to secure paternity. The only way to know, like no hymen, no diamond, right? And that's because if you had private property, you wanted it to go to your offspring. And the only way to know for sure it was your offspring is if your woman has never slept with a man other than you. Otherwise, there was no way to know for sure. And so unfortunately now, or fortunately, I guess, now we live in a, in a realm where you, if somebody's cheating on you and you get cocked, you get to know. There is medical tests you can do. There is, like, you can obviously tell these things. Blood types. Even, even without, like, the DNA test, you can do a blood type. If you know your blood type and you know your wife's blood type, you can know what your kid's blood types should be. And if it doesn't match that, then you know. There was actually a thing. I can't remember. This is like 2005 or something like that. Some school thought it'd be really good to teach kids about biology. And they were like, uh, you're going to find out about your blood type and what the rotogens are. Or rotogens? Rotogens? I don't know how to pronounce it. And what the blood type is. Like, what's an A? What's an O? What's a B? What's, po what's the rotogen positive, rotogen negative? And they're like, yeah, you can go home and ask your dad and ask your mom. And then you find out that and we'll show you how the blood types mix and children do that. And they had to stop it because there was like a couple kids who were like, that's weird. My mom is a B positive. My dad or my mom is a positive. My dad is a positive. Why am I? Why am I a B negative? <laughs> they're, they're like, what? <laughs> uh, never mind. <laughs> so they had to cancel that. So that was pretty funny. So yeah, um, as far as the virgin thing now, like I get where it's coming from, but it's, it's, it's a fiction. You're never going to find it. Girls are not virgin. There's no virgins anymore. I don't care unless you're Amish. And even then the Amish girls just lie really well. The Arabs used to say that the Islam will save the West. Do you know there's hymen reconstruction surgery? That's what they do in the Middle East. Oh no, see, I'm still a virgin. Oh, it's true. The hymen's right there. There's a clinic in Turkey you go to. So yeah, if there's... The deception and detection arms race keeps moving on. So really what it is, is guys are trying to sell you on their own type of um, secondary characteristics to promise you a, a problem-free life. Like, if you find a virgin, you'll be fine. You're not going to find a virgin. Girls have been having sex since they were 13, 15, whatever age you want to pick. I know this. I went in my high school, my first year of high school as a freshman, grade 8. I remember this because my one friend, we used to play Nintendo together. Her name was Bonnie. And then grade eight, she showed up after I didn't see her for the summer. And then all of a sudden she had a kid. And I was like, that's weird. <laughs> when did that happen? She had slept with some 18 year old dude before at like 13. And it's like, there's tons of examples like this. Every girl, if you get a girl honestly talking to you about their sex life, some of the stuff they'll hear will horrify you. Some situations is just, yeah, I was fun and it was okay. And other times it was not fun and it was not okay, but they all have a story. So this, yeah, false hymen. So yeah, this virginal thing, it's just missing the whole point. It's like, we don't live in agricultural times anymore. You're not going to be a farmer. This isn't going to happen. So what you really have to look for, and this is the only thing that matters anymore, and I'll end you with this. There is no quality a girl can have that will prove to you she's going to be loyal to you forever. All you have is your boundaries and your value. And that's it. Know what you want. More importantly, know what you don't want. Express what your boundaries are. And when girls cross them, it shows they're not sufficiently invested in you and be willing to throw them away. And that's it. 
And if you do this well enough, you will eventually, the only girls that will be left are the ones that have been invested and have respected your boundaries. And you won't have to like, how do I find a wife? You'll just happen upon a relationship, man. Like they just happen. When everybody says they'll happen, that's why. Because you're not focused on finding a girlfriend. You're focused on the process. And so the people that best adhere to your process are the ones that are just there. You'll be noticing all of a sudden two years later, you're like, dude, this girl's been in my life for two years, has done nothing, nothing that would make me want to send her to the streets. And she's like, oh, I wish you'd say you love me and wish we could start dating. You're like, might as well. <laughs> like at this point, that's how it happened with me. Some stripper flaking on me and then I was with this girl, like my girl. And like, oh, why not? We'll give it a shot. But yeah, you got to like, look, the religious guys, the trads, they really have lost the war or whatever culture war, the sexual war, whatever you want to talk about. They're living in the past. They truly are. And they're not even that big a thing. They're a very small minority. The problem is just like the social justice warriors and the feminists, they're very loud and they're very obnoxious. And because their stupidity knows no bounds, they get an inordinate amount of attention in the attention economy. You just have to remember when you see these fundamental trad caths or whatever is that they're just a meme. Most people don't care. They really don't. And you don't have to care. Not about that. Care about the shit that matters. So on that note, I'm going to leave you to it. Let's get some boobs and then show off the end. One of the guys who ran the Red Pill channel sent me a message. I actually appreciate that you took it from an idea-based perspective instead of ever resorting to personal attack. Like, if this movement is actually going to be dangerous, do we need to understand it so that we can take it down? I knew going into it that this might be a hot mess. I'm not going to have those guys back on my channel again. Absolutely not. Transformed. Charming. Good-looking. And in shape, but bored. I need something to do next. Another challenge to conquer. Please give it to me. All right, boys, that's it. I'm out, you're out, let's do it. Put 22 seconds of this on there for the end card. And don't forget, rule zero, it's starting in... Oh, it's starting in an hour, so we got some time. Go grab yourself some lunch, go grab some breakfast, I'll prep the show and we'll have a lot of fun, okay?